Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. You have just been within earshot of a drowning. Not such a drowning as will cause shouts of alarm throughout the world, nor even a headline. Just tears, quiet remorse. For the lady who is weeping just drowned her doll, and a part of her life, and a part of her reason. She'll go on from here to people. She'll go on from here to kill by poison. So tonight, my report to you on the torment of Henrietta Robinson and why she killed. Crime Classics, a new series of true crime stories from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. The year is 1845 in the city of Troy, New York. It was summer, and the Trojans were all excited about the town's 56th anniversary, and showing it. Each weekend, the banks of the Hudson were strewn anew with burned-out fireworks and chicken bones, and the broken crockery mixed well with empty clamshells. The Trojans took easily to gay festivals, and the chronicles of Troy of the Times tell us that 1845 was, and I quote, of glee and profound merriment. The scene we're interested in took place on a Sunday in summer twilight and has to do with a boy and a girl. They found an idyllic spot, as young lovers will do, which consisted of this, a grove of white birch and sumac and a pond, a clear and shallow pond of still water and sandy bottom and a soft, warm breeze. Young lover, just sit as you are, Henrietta. Young lover. Like this? Oh, happy time, gentle time. So I can remember how beautiful you are. To you, Joseph, I'd lower my eyes, but that I wish to look at you constantly. Henrietta. Yes? The doll. Here. You may hold her. You may go to Joseph Cecily. Take her. She likes you. No. No? Listen, dear. What? Why do you bring her always with us? Why do you pretend she's a person? Well, she is. Aren't you, Cecily? She is. My sister threw away her dolls at 15, and you're 17. And because one day I hope... Shh. What? Shh. This world we're in, the quietness of it, trees and the sky... How very blue it is. And look there at the wildflowers. The hummingbird. And you. And you, dear Joseph. May I kiss you? Oh, please don't. <laughs> there, I protested. Now kiss me. Oh, wait. What are you doing? Cecily's watching. I'll turn her face about. <laughs> Stop it. Henrietta. You're making fun. Stop it. All right. I'll show you. Oh, dear, what? Show you! Henrietta, put down that stone. <laughs> Henrietta! No one will ever know. What? This place we're in. This time. And how we love each other. Ask me again, Joseph. About what? Not to go back home to Quebec. To write my parents that I've found my true love. And you want to marry me and keep me here? I do. You were going to kiss me. Please kiss me. Oh. Cecily didn't watch. All of us 
have our darknesses and silent screamings, but most of us don't throw stones at people. Henrietta Robinson did, and she treated her doll like it was a person. But outside of that, Henrietta was quite a successful girl of 17. Her small, quick angers were rare intervals between serenities and sweetnesses. She was beautiful and fairly formed, and possessed of a background of elegance and wealth. Her parents in Quebec had realized a considerable fortune from a fox trap, much used in the Hudson's Bay area. When Henrietta's mother received a letter from Troy, New York, which stated that her daughter was deeply in love, she summoned her husband immediately from his fox traps and held family counsel. A result of which, Henrietta was summoned home from her school in the United States. And as soon as she entered the house, a scene was made. I will not have it. I will not have it. Imagine. But I love him truly. I forbid it. Do you hear me? I forbid it. How could you? Joseph is handsome and he's gentle. A farmer's son. No background. Oh, I'm so ashamed. I'm not. I want him for my very own. What joy to hold him. Oh. And when he kissed me, heaven was close. Oh. And he will be mine forever and ever. Oh. No matter how hard you hit that table, Father. Oh, girl, listen to me. You will not marry a farmer boy. You will not ever see him again, nor think of him. And as for marriage, you will marry whom I say. And his name is George Locius. And his name is George Locius. And he is a gentleman and a horseman and a soldier and has wealth and castles in England. He has seen a portrait of you and loves you madly. What, what are you doing, Henrietta? And he... John, look at her. And he... Henrietta, what's wrong with you? Stop carving up my table with my letter. Open up. Child. Henrietta. <laughs> a fine Regency table, her father's favorite for pounding. But nevertheless, she did meet George Locius. And surprisingly enough, they got along well together. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine Lady Melville dropping her fan at such a moment? <laughs> and later? Take a card, dear Henrietta. This one? Any one at all. You take one, Cecily. Here, I'll help you. You, I mean your doll, took the three of spades. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's very close. He wasn't very successful with card tricks, but he was an expert horseman, a daredevil of the high jumps. Oh, it's exciting watching you, George. Isn't it, Cecily? Give us your hand. Uh, up we go. Oh, yeah. oh hold tight. Now, you got it. Take the square. And one night, in a place young people always seem to find, beneath a maple tree whose leaves shone silver under the first autumn moon. I believe Cecily likes me, Henrietta. Oh, she does. And you? Cecily wouldn't like you unless I did. Henrietta, I've loved you since the moment I saw your portrait. What are you doing? You'll want to kiss me, won't you? I'm turning Cecily's head away. Oh. Now you may kiss me. Oh, dear Henrietta. I said, dear Henrietta. Daddy wants me to marry you. Will you? And Mother wants me to marry you. Will you? Well? Let's marry him, Cecily. Henrietta, dear. Cecily. 
Henrietta! Where are you hiding, Henrietta? One doesn't hide on one's wedding night, Henrietta. Where are you? Henrietta! Higher guard. Oh, what has happened to you? Why are you teasing the stallion? What's what's I, happened? I, I, Come, I'll take you back to the house. No. You're my wife. You'll do as I say. No. Wife. Hold me. It was the beginning of October when they set off for George's home in Europe. They booked passage on a steamer out of New York. And to get there, they stopped overnight at Troy. I must do some last-minute shopping, George. But why are you taking Cecily? Well, Cecily always liked Troy. And the two of them, Henrietta and her doll Cecily, instead of shopping, went down to a place which consisted of this, a grove of white birch and sumac almost leafless now, and a pond of water growing cold, a place dying the season's death, but remembered for the time when young lovers sat in summer, and one was called Henrietta, and the other... Joseph. Joseph. Gone are you, Joseph. Where are you? Are you dead? Are you dead, Joseph? And cold? Go to him, Cecily, and warm him. <laughs> she just drowned her doll and a part of her life and a part of her reason and grew closer to violence. Closer. are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. The year was 1849, the time when everyone was heading toward California and Mr. Sutter's farm. But Henrietta and husband George Locius set sail for England. It was a leisurely and serene trip under sail, marred only by one occasion. One of the voyagers on the last night out claimed that Henrietta tried to push him into the sea. The statement, however, was met with disbelief since there had been a gay party aboard and everyone had dressed like pirates and there was much mock villainy and talk of walking the gangplank. In England, George Locius brought his wife to his estate a few miles north of London. Here they lived the life of English aristocracy riding to hounds, puttering among the primroses, and having two children. It was the good life in a drafty mansion. There was, however, a servant problem. It seems that every upstairs maid got the feeling somehow that Henrietta was trying to throw her off one parapet or another. Each, in her turn, the maid would complain to Squire Locius, who uh, would do this. <laughs> That's the way George scoffed. And he would do this. Here's a week's wages, and I'll write to a letter of reference. Said, please pack your bags and leave. But on about the sixth upstairs maid, this happened. And I'll write to a letter of reference, and please pack your bags. No. Wait here a moment. May I come in, Henrietta? Just a minute. Now you may come in. I want to talk to you, Henrietta. 
Do you like this gown, George? It came from Paris this morning. I never like you in black. You know that. Why are you always wearing black these days? Uh, and, and why... Why what? Why have you taken to wearing that heavy black veil when you go about? You know. No. No, I don't. Of course you do. To confuse them. Oh, now, Henrietta. Is that what you wanted to talk with me about, George? Hester said you tried to push her off the east parapet. Oh? She said she was shaking the mop and you came up behind her and pushed her. Wouldn't you? What are you talking about? She's one of the people, George. Oh, now, for heaven's sake, what are you... Oh, it's entirely a matter of self-preservation. She was put here to get rid of me. Hester, to get rid of you? One of the people. Come to the window with me, George. See there? What? Don't pretend. What am I supposed to see? It's useless to talk with you. But what am I supposed to see? Simply what's there out in the garden. The faces. Oh, for heaven's sake. And something else I'll show you, too. This. A pistol? Really, now? When did you buy a pistol? If they should try to come close to me... Henrietta! In the name of... Whether or not she was aiming at George, we cannot know. We do know she didn't hit him. We do know that when she deserted him and their two children and returned to this country, he made no effort to bring her back. Nor did he ever have any trouble keeping an upstairs maid. Of the further history of George, we know nothing definite. Uh, we can assume he brought up his children to be every inch as good an Englishman as he, and as good horsemen, and probably much better at card tricks, and undoubtedly more finicky about wives. Henrietta went directly to Troy, New York, and of her stay here, I'd like to quote a bit from a newspaper of the day. Henrietta Robinson, as so she called herself, was found wandering through the city clothed in night apparel. She drank and raved over her broken hopes. She was found groping in the dark through the halls of public buildings, inquiring for the police office, and demanding of authority assistance to protect her against imagined persecutions. She wandered about the city armed with her revolver and presented it on several occasions at the breast of anyone who had the curiosity to observe her movements. So we have come to the point in the history of Henrietta when she had become a very real menace. But no one did anything about it. They let her roam and wander and grope and present her revolver, and one day she was no longer young. And one dusk in the springtime she wandered down to a certain pond which was surrounded by birch and sumac. And there was a youth there. Hello. Oh, good evening. Isn't this a lovely place? Yes. Yes, it is. I stumbled upon it. Is your and... name Joseph? Why, no. Sit with me. I'd like to. Do you uh, come here often? Whenever I can. Why? To sit here. To look into the pond. Why? I try to remember why. I always try to remember. There's something... I don't know. I was waiting for someone. A girl? But... Yes, but she's very late. I suppose she'll not come. I'd best be going. Oh, wait. Sit here with me for a while. Talk to me. Talk to you? Is your name Joseph? I have to go. If you leave me again, I'll kill you. What? I would. What? Well, that's... A real gun. I would. I, I have no money. I, I don't understand. P please. Please, I was only waiting for... Where did you go when you went from me long ago? Don't be frightened of me. See, I I'll put away this ugly thing, this pistol. No, don't be frightened. You always go away. And there's always the sound of you going away. Then why do I come here? to this pond and remember remember what remember what Dum, 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 
dum, dum, dum, dum. <laughs> and that's all you get. Buy me a drink. Buy me a drink. Kitty, you've had enough. I know. But you're a friend of mine, and you're also the barmaid here. And you have no money. No. Kitty. And no drink. Lend me two dollars. I don't have it. Then I'll lend you some. Hundreds. You ought to go home. Oh, please, Kitty. A drink. Kitty. Hey, Henrietta. I was asking Kitty to buy me a drink. Tell her how good my credit is, Mr. Lanigan. Ah, you ought to go home. Your barmaid thinks my credit's no good. Tell her how good it is. Here in my place, you got no credit. Dance with me, Mr. Lanigan. Ah, hmm. <laughs> oh, come on, come on. Dance with oh, me. Oh, get away from me. Oh, you won't. That fella there just came in, Will. <laughs> Young man. Well, now, sister. <laughs> young man, will you dance with me? And having danced with me, will you buy me a drink? <laughs> dance to what? Dum, 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 dum. That. <laughs> well? Well? Well, sure, I'll dance with you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Dum, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, there, young man. Did you enjoy your dance? <laughs> then buy me a drink. Uh, what's your pleasure? Oh, a kitty, gin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Gin's my pleasure. Well, drink away. <laughs> oh. Young man. Yeah. Another. Why, oh, sure. Hey, hey, Lanigan, where are you going with that gin bottle? She can't have no more. Young man, tell him. Oh, uh, Lanigan's saloon, sister. He says what goes. I danced with you. Yeah, you got your gin? Get out of here, Henrietta. What a way to talk. Can I take her home, Mr. Lanigan. Uh, just get her out of here. Come on, Henrietta. Uh, don't touch me. Don't touch me. <laughs> I told you to get out of here. Now I want you out of here. <laughs> out of here. Out of here. Let go of me. Stop it. Stop <laughs> Someone still could have stopped her. Someone who could see the stricken face, hear the mumblings, and realize that such a woman, one who brandished a gun every place she went, one who lived in a world of tortured fancies, and set the cry for someone named Joseph tumbling down alleys and dark streets, and always there was the gun. Someone still could have stopped her, but no one did. She was a whole night away from murder. No one stopped her. Perhaps it was because she was a familiar sight in Troy by this time. Perhaps it was because the Trojans hadn't run out of their jokes about her. Perhaps it was because of the way she finally killed. She pawned her gun for three dollars. Then she went to a druggist. She bought two dollars worth of arsenic. In the early afternoon, she was as sober as she had been for a year. She went back to Lanigan's saloon, arsenic hidden but waving her last dollar bill. Good afternoon, Kitty. Here, take this money. Oh, you don't owe us anything. She owes us anything, Mr. Lanigan. <laughs> well, if she does, we'll forget it. That's kind. Ah. Yeah, mind if I tell you something, Henrietta? Yes? When you're like this, when you're sober, you're almost what I'd call pretty. Now, don't you start that like the rest. Why, well, I was only trying... Now, to... don't you start that, that's all. Oh, he didn't mean anything. He was telling the truth. I bet you were a real beauty when you were my age. Henrietta. Yes? Someone once told me you were married to an English baron or something. I think so. I think I was. I think I had... I fetch your comb. I comb your hair if you want. If the both of you will join me in coffee first. I'll get some from the urn. Oh, no, let me. I love to serve. I'd consider it a pleasure. And I would, too. 
Just uh, turn that brass spigot on the urn. Uh, did you hear me? I said... Oh, I was just getting the cups ready. Do you wish them sweetened? Uh, no. Uh, nor I. <laughs> yours, Kitty. And Mr. Lanigan. Thank you. Where's yours? I'll get it. Now, we can all sit and chat. <laughs> Is this that new brand coffee, Mr. Lanigan? Well, no. This tastes funny, doesn't it? I remember now. Oh, what? About England. There was a huge mansion, and I was lady over all of it. Would you like to hear about it? Oh, yes. Drink your coffee, and I'll tell you. <sighs> It was a very large house, I think. And it sat upon a gentle hill. And Strange taste. What did you say? Oh, nothing. I, I'm sorry I interrupted. Go on. And it was drafty. But there were great roaring fires. And sometimes in the great hall... Kitty, the barmaid, died from arsenic poisoning that night. Mr. Lanigan, the next morning. Henrietta was tried and found guilty of murder and sentenced to hang. There were murmurings, however, and talk of insanity. And one bright young lawyer made a plea based on the responsibility of society toward a tormented woman. On the basis of this plea, Henrietta was not hanged. They put her in prison where she sat for the rest of her life behind bars and a black veil. And this is the story of the world and Henrietta Robinson. Henrietta Robinson, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. And the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Sammy Hill was heard as Henrietta. Featured in the cast were Betty Harford, Joseph Kearns, Sam Edwards, Lamont Johnson, Paula Winslow, and Ben Wright. Bob Lamont speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.